So let's get a few things out of the way right at the bat. First of all, the premise behind this episode is a little ridiculous and has several logical flaws in it. Uh, things that you could easily nitpick continuity-wise and whatnot. This may sound like a weird statement, but this is actually one of my favorite Voyager episodes. I mention how weird of a statement that is because this is also, in my personal opinion, the single most depressing episode of Star Trek ever. And I don't mean depressing as in bad or discouraging or terrible or anything. I mean depressing. I mean grief-stricken. And the funny thing is, that was kind of insisted on. There's a name I'm going to start bringing up more and more over the next several seasons, really, but episodes especially. The name is Nick Sagan. Yes, that probably should sound familiar. He's his son. And uh, he actually did a decent amount of work with Voyager. Did some good stuff with Voyager, actually. And uh, there will be... Uh, he, he did some good work with uh, the late TNG era as well, and I believe he did a couple things for DS9. I'm not sure about that, but I'll be mentioning his name whenever it comes up, because he's one of those weird kind of writers who comes up with fascinating ideas and then... Well, I guess I guess I shouldn't say and then because it kind of depends on an episode by episode basis. But he does come up with some very fascinating ideas, and that's that's one of his strengths uh, as a writer. So, the, but I mentioned the Nick Sagan thing because he insisted the episode end this way. There was actually a lot of contention in the writing room of how this episode should end, and that should be obvious. Some people had the perspective that I'll be talking about more in detail later, namely. Well, they're not the real crew, so who cares about what happens to them? Which is kind of horrible. Um, the other perspective that was being said was, we can't end a Star Trek on something that dark. That terrible. But several people pushed back, and as you can see by the episode, you know they did get the darkest, the most depressing possible ending available uh, out into the episode proper. And again, Nick Sagan was really pushing for that. The... Uh, one of the compromises that was mentioned as a possibility was, what if we have it where they actually get out that time capsule? They mention it in the episode, so that Voyager gets the time capsule and is like, oh my god, you know, it's kind of similar to what happened in uh, Timeless, where present Harry actually gets the message from future Harry, and so he has an understanding of what happened. But no, we have the most horrible possible resultant here. Thanks, Nick. Um, the original ideas for this, so you might wonder why they're going back to an episode that came out all the way back in Season 4. Uh, episode 24, I want to say? Something like that. In other words, it's been about a year since Demon came out. Um, the thing is, and I think I've mentioned this before, they were wanting to go back to that well several times. Uh, several of the writing staff in the writing room had ideas about how they could, you know, re-examine re that and the, the duplicate crew and all that fun stuff and different things they could do with them. Uh, one of the original ideas was that the duplicate crew would actually be on Earth. I, th I believe I brought this up before because it was relevant to another episode uh, where they actually wanted to show... They wanted to have stuff that wasn't set in the Delta Quadrant and they were thinking about how to make that happen and one of the best methods they came up with was having uh, this alternate crew find some shortcut or wormhole or something that got them home so the Voyager crew is home but it's not actually them you know that kind of a thing uh, and, and there were actually some really wild thoughts being tossed around and I get I credit Berman Braga for the fact that he was supportive of this idea to have two shows going on at the same time basically the crew of Voyager back on Earth and the crew of Voyager in the Delta Quadrant I have to admit I think that would have actually been kind of interesting because then you keep the explorative, total unknown aspect of the Delta Quadrant for stretching out and doing whatever, and you get to see the more political down-to-earth, oh my god, what's happening post-Dominion War situation going on back, back home. Now, of course, that would require talented writers and talented producers and talented people in order to make that actually work, and as Michael Piller says later on, uh, it, god, not even that long from now, like five more episodes or something like that, um... The mere fact that that decision was not made, that that trigger was not pulled, is probably indicative of the of the fact that nobody working on Voyager really had confidence in their own work on Voyager. And I know this sounds like a weird problem to have, but I feel like that's really the flaw from Voyager from Season 6 onwards. I'll talk more about that when we get to Equinox, though. Let's just leave that for there. So all of these ideas were being tossed around, and they are all ultimately shot down. 
This finally is how they brought the thing back into the floor, bought it, bought it in. And the funny thing is, at no point in time did it occur to me, prior to this viewing for this show, for this episode that you're listening to right now, that this was done to make the viewer question. Now, I know what you're thinking. What do you mean by question? The deliberate intent was to make it so that the audience didn't know which of the previous episodes in the past year were the original Voyager crew, and which ones were the new Voyager crew. There's obviously some similarities between between the two, excuse me. Uh, one ni nice, tiny little point of continuity, uh, the duplicated crew, uh, duplicated Tom, is still a lieutenant. So we do know for an absolute fact that 30 days happened to the original Tom, who was demoted to Ensign for that effect. Remember that? Um... I mention this because that's pretty much the only thing we have. And it was done deliberately. They actually made a point of having him wear the lieutenant insignia. Nice touch, by the way. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I I found that an interesting thought. Because uh, it never even occurred to me. I always assumed this was the only episode where we saw the duplicate crew. But apparently the intention, and again, this is from the word of the mouth of the writers, was th you're not supposed to know which of the previous episodes were the duplicate crew or not. Now, you notice I keep saying duplicate, not fake. I'll get into that a little bit, little bit later, but I do f stand firm in my statement that calling these people's imposters or fakes is being unnecessarily negative, but I'll get to that. Um, so here's an interesting thing. When this episode came out, it was very polarizing amongst fans and amongst the actual crew who worked in Voyager. The thing I find fascinating about this is I feel like... I've often said Voyager is a great way to put a magnifying glass over how television was back in the 90s and, and, and during that era. Because... All of the polarization was about the fact, you know, most of the negativity comments were about the fact that, well, this isn't even the real crew. Why should I care about these people? These aren't Voyager. Get them off my screen. I mention that because all in all the ways that television has changed in the last decade and a half, you'd think that nowadays objections would be more along the lines of, oh my God, that was horrible. They're all dead. And, you know, it, it, there's other things that you could look at, but at no point in time has anyone in more modern eras that I've talked to about this objected that this was a fake crew. No one felt cheated by that. And the, and the funny thing is, this is in many ways a it was all a dream episode. But it is so well presented and so tragic in that that I don't think it really qualifies under the standard category of it was all a dream. It was all a dream is usually a cheap, easy way to smash the reset button. This episode definitely smashed the reset button. But it did something with it along the way, and I think that's really the distinguishing uh, thing there. So, I, now i got to say, unfortunately, I only have a single page of notes for this episode, and it's not a lot. I found myself just watching a lot of this episode. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have seen me do you know, live ruminations or whatever, but it, basically I'm sitting there like this, like you're seeing me right now, just watching the episode. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And every now and again I'll take a note. Uh, you know, based on what I'm seeing and that kind of thing. I try to do it in order, and I actually have this new method, uh, which I've been using since the Zelda ruminations at the, at the end of last year, to uh, try and make things more organized for you guys. I'm trying, I'm trying to improve my methods. You know how it is. And uh, so I'm going down the list, and most episodes I'm like... Tch, 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 tch. I sometimes have to pause the episode because I have so much to write as a note. This episode is more like this. This isn't boredom you're seeing on my face. I was, I was engaged. I was just locked with my screen, like, oh my gosh, oh my god, oh my god. And then every now and then I'm going to be like, I haven't written a note in a while. And then I'd think about it, but I don't really have anything to talk about. I'll just go back to watching it. <laughs> I, I mention this because if you've ever wondered why I say I tend to have not as much to say about good episodes, that's kind of where it is. I don't have much to say about it. It's a good episode. And so my first note here is literally just the wedding, because the wedding scene was great. I liked it. Now, I did make one note. The wedding scene is 5 minutes and 16 seconds long. Now, you might be like, well, why is that relevant? That's kind of a short wedding. Yes, but that's the teaser. I don't believe this is still... I, I don't think this is the longest teaser in Trek history. This might be the longest Voyager teaser in Trek history, but that is a damned long teaser. It, it, and just on the off chance you don't know what I'm talking about, that's 5 minutes and 16 seconds before we even hit the opening title crawl of Star Trek Voyager. That's a huge chunk of time. The average uh, teaser length uh, is runs around 40-ish seconds. So five minutes? And yet it is so effective. 
because the first time you're viewing this, oh, by the way, I guess I should mention I'm spoiling the hell out of everything. Sorry. That's how this works. Um, first time viewing this, I was just like, oh my God, they're, they're actually tying the knot and they're actually moving forward with something. And this is actually going to be a character driven episode. That's great. Uh, for those of you not aware, the teaser ends with the floor getting wonky and the rice literally falling through the floor as its mo molecules start to decohese. And then it's like, oh, God. And my actual initial reaction when I first saw this was, Ugh, really, there has to be a threat to the ship. We can't just have a character-focused episode. I will say something interesting about this one, though. There is no A, B plot or C plot or anything like this. There is just the primary plot of this episode. There's no guest stars. There's nothing. There's not even really a true threat to the ship situation other than the one instance with the other ship. This is all about the plight and tragedy and dilemma of these people. And it's solely focused on that. And this episode is a great way uh, to, to shine a light on why I think the A-B plot formula is not necessary. It works in some circumstances. It can work. I've pointed out episodes where it works, but adhering to it as a doctrine is unnecessary, and this episode shows why. There is no A-B plot here, and yet that laser focus on this structure of this episode and the plot of it and the characterization of it is great. I actually genuinely cried twice in this episode. That's a lie. Three times in this episode. And I am not ashamed to admit that. It was really well done. But the other point I want to mention here... If you remember my first few uh, videos, especially the one I did about Caretaker all the way back in season one, God, that feels like forever ago. You know, we've been doing these videos for almost two years now. I forget the exact time. I figured it out a few episodes ago. Anyways, all the way back in Caretaker, I mentioned why I kept watching Voyager. And it wasn't adherence to Star Trek. That's not enough for me. Even when I was you know, much younger than I am now, you know, 15 years ago or however long this started, that wasn't enough to keep me watching a show. Loyalty to a brand only extends as long as that brand delivers, right? Ask Squaresoft how that worked out for them, or Bioware if you want. The moment you fail to deliver on the quality, I'm out. So that wasn't why I kept watching Voyager. It was all because of the chemistry. The chemistry between the actors was brilliant even from day one. And there was amazing dynamic between all the actors and their characters. And it kept me engaged, even through the dreck of season one and the garbage of season two. I was just like, I, I wanted to keep watching because I liked these people. And I felt like they really had great uh, energy on screen. The wedding scene really reminds me of that. There's Other than the, the thing right at the end, there's nothing really significant happening. Tom and Bellana are finally tying the knot. That's not a huge deal, really. It's just another logical step in their progression of character and in their relationship. There's no big, you know, this is informative of the characters. Seven is acting like Seven. The Doctor's acting like the Doctor. I liked the bit, uh, how Her Harry playing with the two-tones, or the, the whatever they're called, um, for the uh, for the thing that was a nice little touch, but ultimately it was all just that chemistry. It was all the characters working together, and when Tom and Bellana say their vows to each other, that was brilliant. I loved that. So, let's talk about Elseworlds. Okay, now this is a great episode to talk about it because this is one of the closest that well, this is actually the closest I believe that Voyager ever gets to an Elseworlds story. Let me explain if you don't know what I mean. Uh, I forget if it's DC or Marvel. I've, I adopted this term years ago. But the idea is an Elseworlds story uh, was a comic that was written by DC or Marvel, I forget which, uh, that had nothing to do with standard continuity. You All the rules didn't apply. You could do anything you wanted. Now, the most common thing for an Elseworlds to do would be an alternate thing. So it's still Captain America, still same mindset, still same whatever, but change this one thing about his past and then see what happens. It's the classic fictional scenario, what if? And there's and I've talked before about why the what if is such an engaging concept, so I don't really need to rehash that. Um, but there are pros and cons of an Elseworld story. The pros, in my opinion, are very obvious. You are no longer adherent to, not, not, not just continuity, because that's not really the point, you are no longer adherent to the status quo. You're no longer adherent to the reset button. You can do stuff in an Elseworlds. You can make permanent changes in an Elseworlds. You could have major events happen in an Elseworlds. 
and you can have them have significance. One of the reasons I was so impressed with Captain America 2, uh, the, uh, the Winter Soldier, was because they were unafraid to completely alter the status quo. That's so rare in an actual, in a non-Elseworld story that I was just blown away by that. And of course, it was a good movie in general, in my opinion. But the cons of an Elseworld are also kind of obvious when you think about it, because none of the rules apply. So a lot of Elseworld stories would be kind of disinteresting. Like, oh, we can do whatever. Quick, let's kill Wolverine. <laughs> it's like one of the most common things, you know. Quick, let's just kill off characters and let's just do this. Because it doesn't matter. You, you see the difference between these two. The, the former is we need to really focus on doing a crafting a story and we don't have to hit the recent button at the end of the episode. The latter is we can do whatever we want. Who cares about what it comps says? I just want to do something because I want to do it. The difference between the two uh, is actually close. It's it's not as big of a gap as you'd think, but the difference in quality and my enjoyment personally from the former stories to the latter is huge. Uh, I can't think of an example right off the top of my head of the latter type, but I can think of an example of the former. All Star Superman, just bam! I can think about that instantly. All Star Superman, which is a comic I highly recommend, by the way. Really, it was an Elseworld story, and it completely took the status quo and flung it out the window and said, this is what we're doing with it. And it was still Soups, it was still Lex Luthor, it was still all the major characters. It still adhered to continuity, everything that had happened before, but it was unafraid to change things for the future. And it was unafraid to use those changes and use those alterations to tell its own story. Um, Kingdom Come, it's also a Superman comic, is another great example of something that had no problems shaking up the status quo and, in and engineering this new situation, this new future, which, again, also got reset, by, or, or didn't get reset, I say, also was changed by the end of it. Really nice stuff there. This is definitely an Elseworld story, and again, I feel it sits in the former category, because the people involved in writing it, and this is true in interviews that, that they've given as well, especially more recent interviews, um, is they looked at this and they said, we don't have to necessarily hit the reset button at the end of the episode. In other words, we could do whatever we want with this crew, why don't we do something with it? And so they show uh, Tom and Bellana and the connection between the two. They show Chakotay's interactions with Janeway. They really delve into how Harry can man up if necessary. They really showcase the camaraderie, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They do something with it. Now, the reset button is hit at the end of the episode because, and there's the, the real crew, you know, the original crew there. But I stand by my statement that I don't think this, is, this qualifies as an it was all just a dream episode. Now, I find it incredibly ironic that they predict, they give the exact number, forgive me for not writing it down, about two years to get back to Earth. If you're not understanding why I find that ironic, this is the end of season five. This show has seven seasons, so... Anyways, um, Tom's description of Earth is interesting to me. He also describes it as, in his own words, uh, a resident, you know, someone who's from Earth. But it's true. He describes Earth very well, I think. He does a great job of depicting, from a down-to-earth uh, perspective, no pun intended, paradise. Because, as we've already discussed, that is what Earth is in the modern era. Earth is paradise. Deep Space Nine really hammered that home. Earth equals paradise. Not the Federation, not the whole of Starfleet, but Earth, that one planet, managed it. They managed to get a true, functional, post-scarcity society going. And I just like the way Tom describes it. Because most of the time people describe Earth in the Paradise thing, especially, again, in Deep Space Nine or in TNG, they, they preach about it. They're like, oh, we have conquered our aliens and we're better people and we're amazing. And that's fine. But Tom just says, oh, it's great to visit and there's so many places to see and there's so many things to do. There's more of a genuine enthusiasm about this is my home and it's awesome as opposed to this is my home and it is awesome that most other people tend to speak with it. I wanted to comment on that. So the irony of this episode is just tragic. In case you're not paying attention, they developed a brand new warp drive, an enhanced warp engine. They never explain what it is, and they don't need to, that will enable them to get home in two years. That's impressive, I gotta say. And they don't actually rely on super dilithium 
or ridiculousness like they do have in other episodes. No, it's just they've found a new way to enhance warp drives. It's it's going to be running hot constantly. They even mentioned in the episode how dangerous this is and how many tests they ran and how much work they put into making it work and how much prep st- time you know they put into testing and, and all that fun stuff. It's great. So I'm with it. They were willing to show their work to earn two-year trip home. That's great. I loved that. The thing that I find horrifyingly ironic about it, and they say it flat out in the episode, they designed an engine that was non-harmful to humanoids. They're not humanoids. And so they literally killed themselves. The, um... One of the next questions that I have, I can't believe I'm even bringing this up because to me this is obvious. But I always like to bring it up because I, I like uh, communal activity. I don't, I don't want to adhere to groupthink, and I like different perspectives. So, do you think the people of this crew, the biomedic crew, basically, do you think that they were sentient and sapient? Do you think they were individuals? Now, the episode itself flat out says that they are, but that's not necessarily indicative. Uh, and there are ways to argue around the fact that they are not, that they are basically just following their programming. Now, I can see that argument. I'm going to present my counter-argument to it. In my opinion, they are the sentient and sapient in the same way that the Doctor became sentient and sapient, sufficiently advanced, key words, in order to be able to qualify for such a category, even if they are following some kind of pre-programmed algorithm. In this case, their memories... Uh, being the algorithm based on the original Voyager crew. That's my take on it. Whether that's true or not is, of course, debatable. I'm interested in hearing your guys' thoughts. Uh, but I have heard a couple of friends, too. Specifically friends within the last, uh, I guess, like two years now, uh, argue that they weren't, that they were basically just drones going about their business because they had to. Uh, one of the big points that was made in favor of that was, was Janeway literally refused to not go to Earth, because the original Janeway went to Earth, and so she was a slave to her programming. So, there is something to discuss there. Uh, McNeil does a great job in this episode. He portrays someone who is terrified as his wife lays dying on the bed, and he is desperate and horrified, and, and, and he does not want to show what he's feeling, and so he doesn't even let himself say anything real or serious he is dis- describing the honeymoon that he knows they're probably never going to have and he is trying to showcase to her it, trying to get her mind off of things while at the same time he himself can't even bear to stand it and then when she actually dies on the table his portrayal he there's just he does a great job mcneil is actually a really good actor i've said this before um, and he does this great job of this moment of shock, and then the shock just goes away, and he just goes back to business as usual. Because that's how people tend to react to that kind of thing. We, we don't go into hysterics most of the time of, oh my god, we just, we lock down. No, no, denial. I refuse. I refuse to, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to fix this. That is, that is a very common human response, and he portrays it brilliantly. And he keeps trying to fix her, and he keeps trying to do it, and he's, no, and then he finally actually shouts at the doctor. Great, powerful scene. And I'm going to go ahead and segue this into another point, which is later on. Tom is the only character we see have a breakdown. His cock about how you're not the real Harry, I'm not the real Tom, she's not actually the captain, why do we have to follow your orders, etc. Because what we thought was true isn't true anymore and therefore that changes everything and i find it interesting because that is absolutely logical of a thought to have but especially for tom why because everything he says is so indicative of the fact that he just lost his wife it's not about the fact that he's not the real tom or that she's not the real balana that woman that individual was someone he loved and cared about enough to marry regardless of whomever they originally were, that's what the status quo, that's what the situation was now. And his trying to portray that she wasn't actually Balana is just him trying to distance himself from that wound, which is still open and bleeding. And it's interesting to me because when he uh, reaches a certain point in the episode, pretty much towards the end, he actually acquiesces or more or less automatically just shows that he still has respect for Janeway that he is still Tom Paris he's just another Tom Paris instead of the original 
Um, I will say one thing. This episode felt like it was going to go down the route that TNG already had. I forget the name of the episode, forgive me. But it's the episode where William Riker encounters Thomas Riker. And I know a lot of you are going to know what I mean by that when I say that. And it, and I find it interesting because they don't actually retread the same ground. Not really. That episode was all about uh, nurture, basically. Not nature versus nurture, just nurture. How different people are based on different circumstances. Same person. It was clearly Riker. It's just this Riker had gone through this life, and this Riker had gone through this life, and the two were very different people as a result of that. And that makes sense. Still the same core person, different overall gradient of an individual. This episode felt like it was going to retread that, but it never does. The only time it's ever brought up is twice. Once by Harry, uh, no, not Harry, excuse me, once by Tom and his discussions with Harry. And again, that's not about who they are as a person or if they are relevant as people. That's about the fact that his wife just died and that he is trying desperately to distance himself from that. So they don't actually discuss it there. The second time it's brought up is when Chakotay and Janeway are discussing it. And Chakotay is arguing, you know, now, this is different, and we're not people, and yada, yada, frickin' yada. And the whole point of that discussion is to showcase that Chakotay, this Chakotay, is still Chakotay, because he's still acting like Chakotay is, because he is still interested in the safety of the crew, regardless of who or what they are. Nice touches on both sides. Um, I mention that, though, because in a typical Star Trek episode, and this is another reason I give this episode praise, a typical Star Trek episode would have smashed the reset button on this, but not in the way you're thinking. They would have done it in the same way they did it in Demon. Okay, here's the third option that makes everyone happy. Here's some way to save the crew. We, we did it. We, we managed some techno babble and we saved the survivors, or we managed to reconstitute the people, and yay, everyone's alive and you get to go live your lives and be free. No, they're dead. They're all dead, and they will never be remembered. Which brings me to my next point. There's a quote here, which I wrote down. It's uh, Duplicate Jane. I really shouldn't say duplicate. There's literally only one scene in the entire episode that isn't the duplicate crew. So, Janeway says to uh, Seven, Harry, and Neelix, who are basically all who's left at this point, none of you deserves to be forgotten. And they talk about they have the ability to make this time capsule with all of their logs, and it can be made with materials that are not degrading, because there are materials like that on the ship. They've, they've shown that. Stuff that they brought on board that was not originally from the, from the demon planet, they actually can make that kind of stuff. So that was a nice touch. And the thought there is, there's going to be some way that's going to work out. And even if it doesn't work out, then maybe they'll get that time capsule out. And again, as I pointed out, that was the original idea, that the new Voyager, excuse me, the original Voyager would get the crew logs and whatnot from the new Voyager, the, the duplicate Voyager. And, you know, oh my god, you know, these, these people died horribly for no freaking reason, they, and they killed themselves. Um, not deliberately, but nonetheless. Obviously, again, that is not what happened. And there is that horrifyingly heart-crushing scene where they're trying to launch the capsule. It's literally a desperate moment. It's like, okay, just get the capsule out. The launch thing is broken, and because it's so broken and because it's trying to launch, the capsule is literally smashed against the hull. Oh. And then at the end, they come within five and a half minutes of the original Voyager. Think about that for just a moment. Think about how close they came. Now, this is astronomically unlikely for Voyager to come into contact with Voyager. I mean, the distances between the two is huge. They do do a little lip service to help explain it. Uh, new Voyager had the new engine, so, like, if you were charting it, here's the demon planet over here, and here's the original Voyager. New Voyager gets the new engine and can go faster and basically catch up and then backlashed back to original Voyager towards the end of the episode. It's feasible, especially since they were probably following the same general course, uh, back to the Alpha Quadrant, or the Beta Quadrant, actually. But it is still admittedly ridiculous that two ships of that size could, could come anywhere near each other in space. And the fact that they do, and the fact that they get so close... Harry's final scenes on the bridge are powerful. He's the only one on the bridge. He's desperate to keep things working. Seven is the only other named character who is still visible. In fact, there are actually a grand total of three characters visible. Harry, Seven, and some random guy in engineering. Oh, I'm lying. They also see Neelix for a second. So four. And 
him just running around desperately trying to make things work, just literally trying to buy, at that point, seconds. He is at the point where he was sacrificing pieces of the ship to make seconds happen. And then he does the most reckless thing he could do. Ejects the warp core while at warp in order to get them in, in range, in order to be able to toss this final last desperate plea of hope towards the original Voyager crew. And then the episode... Oh, wow. I'm actually tearing up a bit. The episode twists the knife. Because we cut to the original Voyager, the, the one scene we see with the original Voyager, and they are racing to the ship. They are desperate to get there. They are on edge. They've got repair, you know, they've got repair and, and, and in, uh, teams ready. The doctor is ready to take injuries. They are there to help, and they're going to do everything impossible. And they, <laughs> and they show up, and they see a bunch of biomimetic gel floating through space. And then they're forgotten. Forgive me for quoting FF9. But uh, it's said that it is worse to be forgotten than to be dead. I wonder what it's like to be both. <laughs> 